Hey guys, it's Ms. Carlson here to talk to you about thermal energy and heat, which is covered in chapter 16 of your textbook. Make sure you have a notebook, sheet of paper, and a Cornell note taking template, and we're going to go ahead and get started. A couple questions I'd like you to think about and try to answer as we go over this lecture is what is a bite of the filling of a hot apple pie or maybe a piece of pizza if you're more of a uh, pizza person? Burn your tongue while the crust does not. Now, both parts of that pie or that pizza come from the same oven, but if you try to eat the pizza too soon, normally that cheese and sauce will burn your tongue or your mouth. Uh, same thing if the filling of a hot apple pie, if you weren't able to hold yourself back long enough. So, um, why don't they have the same temperature if they were in the oven for the same amount of time? The other question I want you to think about is why does the air in a balloon, uh, the concrete of a sidewalk, and almost everything else expand as it heats up? Well, water kind of does something a little bit different. Let's go ahead and see if we can figure it out. Well, the one thing we need to start with is thermal energy and what it is. A lot of people think of the word thermal and they just think of heat and temperature, but it actually depends on the mass of the object, the temperature of the object, as well as the phase or the state of matter of that object. And I have two pictures here, one of an iceberg and one of a cup of coffee. And the iceberg has much more mass than that hot cup of coffee. Even though the temperature of that hot cup of coffee is high, it does not surmount uh, the amount of mass that that iceberg has. Therefore, that iceberg would have a greater amount of thermal energy. Now, it is helpful to remember what all matter is made up of in order to understand this. And so we know of these little tiny guys called atoms, and when these atoms get warmer or hotter, uh, the greater the kinetic energy is, and therefore the greater thermal energy. And thermal energy is the total energy um, which is made up of kinetic energy and potential energy of the particles that make up a substance. So when a substance is heated, we say that the temperature is raised, or we think of how warm or cold something is when we think of temperature. But it's not only that, it's the average kinetic energy per molecule in a substance. And that's what you have to remember. And temperature is based on the random motion of these molecules and atoms, which is why when we do use the thermometer to measure the temperature of something, uh, that liquid in the thermometer moves up because the, the, the molecules in that liquid are getting heated up, they're getting excited, they're moving around a lot more, and the only way for them to move is up. So the scale is here to give us an indication of just how much temperature uh, that substance has. Now, a few other facts. It's important for you to remember we use the Celsius scale on a regular basis in science. So it's from 0 to 100 degrees Celsius. Now, it's helpful to understand since we, on a daily basis on the news here, uh, the Fahrenheit scale. And to us, you know, a normal body temperature would be, our internal body temperature would be 98.6 degrees. But on a Celsius scale, it would be 37. So if you were to understand the temperature scale, if you kind of remember that at 30 degrees, that's kind of hot for you outside. 25 degrees is more like a room temp, comfortable t-shirt and shorts. 10 degrees Celsius would be jacket and pant weather. And then, of course, your zero degrees, which is when water freezes, uh, definitely bundling up weather. And then, of course, at that other end, at 100 degrees, water is going to boil, which would, is very hot. Now, there is one other uh, number you need to be aware of. That is absolute zero. And this is actually on the Kelvin scale. It is the lowest possible temperature, which means that there is a most minimal amount of kinetic energy that a substance could possibly have at this point. Now, this has never been found in nature, but it has been recreated in the lab at some point in time. So it's mostly good to know information that that is uh, the lowest amount of thermal energy we can possibly have at 0K. Alright, so why do you get burned if you touch a Well, the reason is, is heat is going to flow or be transferred from anything that's going from a high to a low temp. So your hand is at a lower temperature probably than the hot stove, so that heat from the stove is coming in direct contact with your hand and being transferred to your hand and causing probably an awful burning sensation. So matter does not contain heat, it just has thermal energy and it transmits heat. So the colder something gets, the less thermal energy it has, the warmer something gets, and the more thermal energy it has. 
So remember that heat is the movement of thermal energy. Things don't have heat. And a classic example of you just holding an ice cube, your hand's coming in direct contact with that ice cube, so the heat from your hand is traveling to the cube and therefore melting the cube due to the properties of water. So how do we measure heat? We measure heat in joules or calories. Calories probably sound a little bit more familiar to you because that's how we measure the energy we get from our food. Now the technical definition of a calorie is the thermal energy required to raise the temperature of one gram of water one Celsius degree. And if we were to find a conversion factor for calories to joules, there are 4.18 joules in one calorie. Now the labels that we use, you can see here that in this particular sample, there are 230 calories, but there is a distinct difference between the capital C calorie and the lower case C calorie, and that is the capital C is actually a thousand times bigger than the lower case. So if we were to put this in our standard unit of the lower case C calories, that would be 230,000 calories. But on our nutrition labels, we keep it the capital C because that's kind of like a better number to work with, right? You don't want to look at something and say, wow, I'm eating 230,000 calories right now. Uh, you feel better about the 230. Okay, so uh, specific heat. This is going to help you answer that question about the pie or the pizza, whichever one you want to refer to. Uh, specific heat is a quantity of heat per unit required to raise the temperature of an object. Objects with a higher specific heat generally are harder to change thermal energy or temperature, but they're also harder to lose it as well. So that liquid or that pie filling is made up of a lot of water. Same thing with other substances like the sauce on a pizza. And water has a very high specific heat as you can see in uh, this chart right here. It has 4.18 joules or one calorie. And that is a high number on the scale of specific heats as you can see compared to um, these other samples. So anything with water in it might heat up a little slowly, but it's also not going to cool off very slowly. So just be careful um, whenever you're heating anything up in the oven, uh, you give it a little bit of time to cool down. Now the laws of thermodynamics are going to help us uh, stay on the right path when we're trying to understand situations concerning heat. The first law states that whenever heat flows into or out of a system, the gain or loss has to be equal to the amount transferred. This is very similar to our law of conservation of mass. Um, it is the law of conservation of energy, saying that mass cannot be created or destroyed. The second law, hopefully you're a little bit familiar with now, heat never spontaneously flows from a cold object to a hot one. Uh, if you take in the case of your air conditioner, that is a machine that actually has to put in work uh, to push cool air into your house. So it's not happening, happening spontaneously. It's happening because of work being done. The third law states that no system can reach absolute zero, which we already discussed. Remember that was zero K or zero Kelvin. All right, moving right along then, um, considering those laws, we have something known as thermal expansion that occurs. Uh, if there is a gain in thermal energy, then an object will generally, or a substance will expand. Uh, when we lose thermal energy, it's going to contract. So if you take a look at this picture over here of a sidewalk, um, and you've probably seen a lot of streets get these cracks in their uh, roads over time. And that's because during the hot times or during the warmer temperatures, uh, that cement or that concrete that that road is made out of is going to expand. And then when it gets colder again and contracts, you get end up getting these cracks over time and that need to be filled in due to that continuous process of expansion and contraction kind of deteriorating that concrete. Okay, so there are exceptions to that and that is mainly water. Water actually does expand as it cools and you can see with this picture of the iceberg here that it is floating in the water even though it has a very large mass and the reason for that is when that water expands it actually gets less dense uh, therefore floating in water at a liquid state which is more dense. Okay, so how does heat get transferred anyway? There are three different types. 
There's conduction, which happens when an object comes in direct contact with something else, especially if we're talking about solids. There's convection. This is when fluid, air, or liquid has movements due to density change. So that warm air is going to rise, and that cool air is going to sink, and that ends up creating a current that just kind of circulates and continues as long as nothing else changes or affects that um, heat transfer. Lastly, radiation is kind of like the sun. It radiates electromagnetic waves so that we feel that heat on Earth. Um, so electromagnetic waves of any type um, is considered radiation. And I do have a little picture here for you showing you all three occurring when you boil water. If you take a pot and hold it by the handle, and if you don't have it insulated, as it gets heated from radiation and the water in the pot, it's going to heat up, and if your hand touched that part, um, conduction would occur, and the heat would be directly transferred to your hand and probably burn your hand. That's why most people use a pot holder or um, cover that um, handle with some kind of insulation. Convection is happening in the water, so the water that is being heated at the bottom is moving up while the cooler water moves down. And this continues until the water is a consistent temperature throughout. Lastly, radiation from the fire flames is moving up and coming into contact with the bottom of the pot, but again through waves, so that is considered uh, radiation. Alright, so last part of our video here, you can sit and listen to the heat transfer song. It is a helpful way to remember how it works, or you can kind of fast forward and get my last uh, bit of notes. There you go. 
Uh, last thing I wanted to say was that you actually are very familiar with one type of heat transfer um, because heat transfers occur whenever matter changes phase. So anytime something goes from a solid to a liquid, liquid to a gas, um, vice versa, you actually have the transfer of heat going on so there's a thermal energy uh, change and that is one um, example that you should be pretty familiar with so you already knew a little bit about thermal energy and heat transfer to begin with. Alright, well we'll see you next time. Of course go back and pause and play as you need to and I'll see you next time.